Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Tanya Ebley, Chairperson of the Webinar Subcommittee. Thank you all for joining today's member webinar, Genome versus Exome Sequencing, Everything You Should Know. To get us started, I have a few housekeeping details to review with you. Uh, perfect. First of all, we encourage questions to be asked throughout the presentation. As a courtesy to our presenters, all attendees have been muted. So please utilize the Zoom Q&A box for questions you may have throughout the presentation. The chat function is also available for discussion throughout the talk. Questions will be read aloud during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. And now I'll turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Angela Darnell, to review the objectives and introduce our speaker. Angie? Hello. Today's learning objectives are to explore the fundamental difference between exome and genome sequencing, including the workflow, coverage, and uniformity. Second uh, objective is to dem demonstrate the technical superiority of genome sequencing over exome sequencing through case studies. Today, we are lucky to be joined by Fen Gua from Perkinomer Genomics. Dr. Fen Gua is board certified in laboratory genetics and genomics by the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics and in molecular genetics by the Canadian College of Medical Geneticists. Dr. Gua earned her PhD in medical engineering and then completed her postdoctoral training at the University of Western Ontario. Dr. Gua worked at the Molecular Diagnostic Lab at London Health Science Center before she started her LGG fellowship training at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Gua joined Perkinomer Genomics in 2020, where she sees, oversees the clinical reporting um, as she, where she serves as a clinical reporting director while also overseeing clinical production and R&D for the NGS section of Perkinomer Genomics. So now we hand it over to Dr. Gua. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. And there's no doubt that genome sequencing and exome sequencing are the top popular worlds in our field. Today, we are going to talking about everything you should know about genome sequencing and exome sequencing. So this is my disclosure. I believe that many of you have been asked about these questions. Is genome sequencing really beyond exome? Today, we are going to do a deep dive, compare exome sequencing and genome sequencing from its workflow coverage, uniformity, resolution of CMV detection, and all the other additional features. Hopefully, after today's talk, you can confidently tell yourself and your patients, yes, genome sequencing is really beyond exome sequencing. In order to fully understand exome and genome sequencing, we need to first understand what exome and genome refers to. So the human exome, including all coding nuclear DNA sequencing, there's around like 180,000 exomes that will be transcribed into mature RNA. Of note, here, generally, mitochondrial DNA is not included in the exome. So the human exome actually includes only one to 2% of the human genome, however, it does contain the majority of the currently recognized disease-causing variants. Our human genome is actually includes all the coding and non-coding nuclear and mitochondrial DNA sequences. And we know that our nuclear DNA encodes almost like 20,000 genes in the human, and mitochondrial DNA includes 37 genes. And most of the base pair is actually comprised the human genomes that are actually repetitive DNA or the non-coding sequence, which including the non-coding RNAs and the variants in which have been contribute to a specific inherited disorder. Exome sequencing and genome sequencing share some common steps, but they also differ from each other. For both exome sequencing and genome sequencing, they all start with gDNA. So the gDNA 
genomic DNA is randomly shared using either enzyme or mechanical force to the range of a 300 to 500 BP. Then followed by end repair, ligation of the adapter sequences for the multiplex sample pooling and sequencing purpose. So at this step, the library is ready for genome sequencing. And this is a PCR-free, unbiased library prep for the genomic sequencing. And the library prep itself is pretty fast, only needs several hours. However, comparing to genome sequencing, our exome sequencing do have need additional steps. And we know that our exome sequencing only interested in the coding region, therefore it will need a target enrichment. And this target enrichment can be amplification based or hybridization based. Currently, most exome sequencing is actually used in hybridization based target enrichment. And this step normally takes around 12 to 7. 72 hours. So after the hybridization, and then the non-interested bridge in fragments will be washed out. And post the hybridization wash, the enriched library can be mounting plaque and then put on the sequencer. Here, I do want to highlight the difference. Remember, our genome sequencing is a PCR-free, unbiased library prep. This is very simple library prep uh, preparation step. However, for our exome sequencing, because of the target enrichment step, it can be lengthy, and also it can introduce some bias of uh, bias of uh, selection and also less performance in the high GC rich region. When we're talking about the difference between genome and exome, obvious. The direct difference between exome sequencing and genome sequencing is its coverage. As we mentioned before, our exome sequencing only captures the coding region, which is around 1 to 2 percent of our whole genome. And then the exome are enriched the exome and generally plus minus 50 BP into the exome intron bundle region. And for some of the exome, it does spike in some well-characterized non-coding variants, but it totally depends on the design. For our capture-free, PCR-free genome sequencing, we are sequencing both the nuclear genome and mitochondrial genome, including both coding regions and non-coding regions. And of course, this is a PCR-free and provide a non-biased sequencing. Why? Why the non-coding region really matters? And we know that although around 85% of the disease causing variants are in the coding region, it is estimated that around 15% of the disease causing variants are actually in the non-coding region. Besides the coverage, another key feature for DNA quality is the coverage uniformity. So here is a direct comparison of the coverage uniformity. And this figure is actually demonstrating the coverage from a chromosome one, the top panel. So the top panel is the data from exome sequencing at an average coverage of 100 times. And the bottom panel is whole genome sequencing data at an average coverage of 40 times. From the picture shows here, we should appreciate that the uniform coverage across the whole chromosome for genome sequencing. However, comparing to genome sequencing, we can see, yes, it seems the coverage is pretty high, 100 times, but we can see the coverage is very spiky. You do have a high coverage in the exome region. However, you have a really low coverage or almost no coverage in the non-coding region. So comparing to gene exome sequencing, genome sequencing provided a more uniform coverage than the exome sequencing. And also because of this uniform coverage, 
it does require lower average depth of coverage across the genome to detect the clinical relevance variant. For example, in order to achieve 99.9% .9 of a sensitivity for exome sequencing, generally you need an average coverage 100 times. But for genome sequencing, and then to achieve the same 99.9% of a sensitivity, you will only need 40 times coverage. And most importantly, and this PCR-free genome sequencing has been shown to cover clinical significance regions better than the capture-based method, such as whole exome sequencing. Why? What is matter? Because of course, and we do want to have the coverage in the clinical significance region, since we do not want to miss the diagnosis. And in addition, when it comes to the coverage of a GC-rich region, genome sequencing really standing out. So this is a plot to demonstrate the coverage of exome sequencing and genome sequencing in the GC-rich region of the RAFSIC gene. And then the y-axis is the percentage of the reads that have more than 13 times coverage. And the X axis is actually the percentage of a GC content. We can see here that with the GC content increase, the coverage of a, the percentage of a coverage has more than 13 times for the exome sequencing significantly dropped comparing to the genome sequencing. Now let's look at a real world example. So this, so the gene KLF2, exon 2 is high, really high GC content. The GC content is around 77%. And we can see the coverage difference between genome sequencing and exome sequencing. So the top panel is genome sequencing and which have, which have a full coverage across the whole exon 2 of these KLF2 genes. And the bottom is the exome sequencing data. We can see clearly in the middle, there's a lack of a coverage in the high GC content. Moreover, the coverage of a mitochondrial genome also differs. We mentioned before, depending on the design, most of the exome sequencing do not include mitochondrial genome. But for the genome sequencing, it covers both the nuclear genome and mitochondrial genome. So here is our internal data. Let's look at three different exon base, exon base one, two, three, versus our genome sequencing data. So for all of these three different exon sequencing base, the nuclear genome coverage are relatively similar, around 100 times coverage. But totally depending on the exome proof design, the mitochondrial genome coverage can be varies a lot, from only 80 times coverage to 1,000 coverage. And for our genome sequencing, although the nuclear genome is only 46 times coverage, we can see that our mitochondrial genome coverage can achieve around 80,000. Because of the coverage and the uniformity difference of genome data, the resolution of a CNV detection also differs between exome sequencing data and genome data. So we know that when it's talking to the resolution of a CNV detection, so your both your probe length and also your uniformity is actually contribute to the sensitivity and specificity of a CNV calling by NGS. And when we're looking at exome sequencing, and then we know that because of exome sequencing are only enriched in the exome coding region, 
you can see there's the coverage in axon region are pretty high. However, in the non-coding region, it's lack of coverage or it's, it's low coverage or totally no coverage at all. Therefore, when you're looking at the cross the whole genome, exome sequencing have a variable coverage across the genome. And because of we have a full coverage in both coding and non-coding region, genome sequencing have a uniform coverage across the whole genome. Why does this, what, what, what does this mean for the probe length and the probe uniformity? Let's take in a CFTR gene as an example. And in the genome data, that will be on your, so let me to use in the laser, laser pen. So in the genome data, we can see that we have a uniform coverage across the whole gene and both axons and introns. If we define the probe as 500 reads per probe, then we can see the uniform probe length across the whole gene. However, in the exon data, yes, we do have a pretty high coverage in the exon region. However, lack of the coverage in the intron region. So if we define the same 500 reads per probe, the probe length in the exon region can be very tiny. However, because of a lack of the coverage in the intron region, the probe in the intron region can be dragged pretty long. What this means for the CNV calling? So in order, we know that in general, in order to call out a copy number event, generally you will need a minimum three probes to be confident call out a CNV event. Just taking this CFT gene again as an example. So here, I have an introgenic deletion, including the axon 11, and see this highlight region. So this deletion, this deletion was extended to intron 10 and intron 11. Therefore, so in the genome sequencing data, so here we totally have four pro show CNV loss. Therefore, at this Axon 11 deletion was called out. However, when we're looking at the axon data, remember, because of we have a lack of coverage in the intron region, so the, the probe in the intron region was dragged pretty long. After normalization, it doesn't indicate a significantly copy number changes. So although the axon 11 did show a little bit drop, the system is not confidently to call out to call it out. So hopefully now we should appreciate a genome sequencing does provide a better sensitivity and specificity, and also most importantly, it provides an accurate breakpoint detection because of the coverage in the non-coding region comparing to the exome sequencing. Axon sequencing only enriched the axon region, which means have a decreased uniformity across the genome, leads to a decreased resolution of a CNV detection. In addition, the breakpoint detection in the axon sequencing might be compromised due to the lack of coverage for non-coding region. Besides the uniform coverage across the genome, the technical superiority of a genome sequencing is actually allow us to further expand it, the clinical utility of a genome sequencing by adding additional variance type with genome data. There's a multiple literature have demonstrated that genome sequencing data has increased the call confidence for short tandem repeats, which allow repeats expansion disorder screening using whole genome sequencing data. Multiple labs, including us, are performing a repeat expansion screening using the WGS data. So here is the data from our internal repeatability study for the short-term repeat reads. 
From this Q table, we can see clearly the uniformity of the WGS data result in an increased accuracy and consistency in determining the repeat size. Between the three, two, three rounds for our intro run precision study, we can see that the exome sequencing result in an inaccurate repeat size in one out of three performed. And genome sequencing, because of the uniform and unbiased sequencing quality, genome sequencing leads to a consistent repeat size calling across all three rounds performed. Moreover, whole genome sequencing data can be reliable reused to characterize SM1 copy number for SMA and to identify potential silent carrier. And then this algorithm is actually utilized to normalize and compare copy number ratio of a distinct SNP between SMA1 and SMA2. So here is our internal validation data. And our result indicates this algorithm have 100% sensitivity and specificity to identify the SMA positive cases, and also 100% sensitivity to call out SMA carrier status. To summarize the difference between exome versus genome sequencing, and then comparing to exome sequencing only capture the coding region, which representing one to 2% of the genome. Genome sequencing is actually sequencing the entire genome and both coding region and non-coding region for both nuclear and mitochondrial genome. And also genome sequencing is a PCR-free unbiased sequencing. Because of the coverage and uniformity across the genome, genome sequencing can detect a full spectrum for the CNV detection from small intragenic CNV to large scale cytogenetic events. And also the uniform, uniform coverage also allow us to screen for a large number of repeat expansion disorder and also shows an increased performance for some difficult regions. And also, this is also uh, one thing really stand out for genome sequencing is like comparing to exome sequencing, genome sequencing have a relatively shorter and sim simple library prep time, which means like you can potentially achieve a ultra rapid genome sequencing. But in the end of the day, what does this mean for our patient? Everything is comes to the diagnostic yield. So recently, we, systemic, we systematically evaluated 2,100 clinical genome sequencing index cases, which totally around 4,100 genome sequencing performed in our laboratory to explore the diagnostic yield of genome sequencing as a first tier test versus as a follow up test. So, among these 2,100, 2,100 index cases, around 55% of the cases actually use genome sequencing as the first tier test. Well, the other 45 had at least one genetic test performed before genome sequencing and genome sequencing was actually ordered as a follow-up test. We can see here around 4% have more than four previously different genetic testing already done. And the most common previously genetic test was gene panel, takes around 62% and followed by microarray. And very surprisingly, and around 36% of the patient they already have uh, exome sequencing was done, still inconclusive before they come in for genome sequencing. So the diagnostic yield for genome sequencing as the first tier test was 26%. In addition, around 26 of the cases was defined as a cases with both findings, 
with a total about 52% of the cases in this cohort for G uh, genome sequencing as a first tier assay receiving a result which associate with the primary indication for the test. And in the cohort with genome sequencing as a follow-up test, genome sequencing further uncovered the diagnostic findings in 27 of the cases. Particularly, genome sequencing further uncovered the diagnosis for 36 of the patients with primary, with, a, with previously microarray was performed, and 30% of the patient with gene panel was performed. And most importantly, I do want to highlight here, so we have 18% of the patients who already have an inconclusive exome sequencing result was further diagnosed. We further trying to explore the key reason of contribute to the missed diagnosis by the previously exome sequencing. Around 20, uh, 29 of these cases, all of the diagnostic findings, it is true that they are located in the coding region. Assuming the data quality is acceptable, these 29 cases might possibly be resolved by reanalysis. However, this additional 27 cases, we will be potentially missed. And the reason including, for example, 10 cases have a disk intronic variance are not included. Seven cases, the diagnosis is actually relatively small introgenic CNV, which was missed due to the resolution of the CNV detection is not enough. And there's a six cases CNV analysis was not performed at all. Two cases have a TNR screening, so repeat expansion screening was not included, and also two cases with mitochondrial genome are not included. So overall, we can see here, the technical superiority of genome sequencing actually leads to an additional of 8.6 of diagnostic rate on top of exome sequencing, which is amazing. So hopefully right now, I already convinced you that genome sequencing is technically superior over exome sequencing. Now, let's look at several real world clinical cases to further demonstrate why genome sequencing is a beyond exome sequencing. Our case one, is a missed diagnosis due to the low resolution of a CNV detection. So case one is a one year old male and the patient presents with bilateral conductive hearing loss, hypertellurism, and mid-face hypoplasia, failure to uh, thrive, congenital etiosis, and the clinical have a suspected diagnosis of halocrine etiosis. And the patients have a no rec remarkable family history. However, they already performed a previously HCLC panel and exome sequencing. Both are negative. It does identify a 4.2 megabit LOH region as a 2Q34 to Q35. However, the data, so all of the data are inconclusive for the diagnosis. So the patient come in for a genome sequencing trial study. The genome sequencing data actually identified a homozygous intragenic duplication of ABCA12 gene located in the exome 2. And this intragenic duplication is very small. It's only 37.6. Kilobits. So here is a screenshot uh, from the software we used for copy number calling. And from the data, we can see here, let me to try to get my laser pointer. So, so we can see clearly, so this is the chromosome 2, Q3, Q35 region. 
And this is a demonstration of the whole gene of ABCA12. And we, from the back reset, we can see that across the whole gene, we have a very uniform coverage. What is coming to this region of uh, axon 2, we can see clearly in your coverage increase. When it's coming to copy number, we can see clearly that the proband, instead of a copy number of two, they have a copy number of four. And interestingly, both mother and father carry a heterozygous of this intragenic duplication. We all know that when, when it's coming to a duplication, we're always asking ourselves what this duplication means for the protein. We know that the ABCA12 gene is associated with autosomal recessive congenital etiosis 4A and 4B. Specifically, 4B is the halocrine type. And we know that our patients have a clinical, di uh, clinical sus suspected diagnosis of halocrine hesiosis, which explains the phenotype very well. And also, it is known that loss of a function is defined as a mechanism of disease. Now we're asking ourselves, where is the duplication? Is that tandem duplication? Is that located in different location or other chromosomes? And we know that 80% of the duplication are actually in tandem. However, there's still 20 are not. And when it's coming to the variance classification, we know that depending on the location of the duplication, we cannot be certain whether the reading frame is disrupted. So when we're talking about duplication, it can be tandem duplication, and also extremely rarely, it can be an inverted duplication or bloating somewhere. Depending on the breakpoint, you might be able to use the split reads identified by the NGS data to find a clue whether this is a tandem duplication. So the split reads identified by NGS data can be an indication of a tandem duplication. So now let's do a deep dive for the IGB data. So the high resolution of a genome sequencing data is actually allows a nucleotide level breakpoint detection. So based on the IGB data here, we can see, we can clearly define the proximal breakpoint and the distal breakpoint. So we can also see here that in the proximal breakpoint, we see some soft cliff reads. So take these reads and perform a blast. And those reads are actually mapped to our intron tube. The same thing for our distal breakpoint, we also see some soft cliff reads. And after blasting, we identify these soft cliff reads. It's actually mapping to intron one. This is a clear indication of a tandem duplication. So based on the breakpoint identification and IGV mapping, we clearly know that this is a tandem duplication. And this homozygous duplication is relatively small. It only covers axon one, extended to intron one and intron, and intron two. It's only 37 point KB, uh, KB in size. So this is my explain why previously gene panel and exome sequencing are all missed. So both parents are actually heterozygous for this duplication. Because of we accurately define this breakpoint and the mapping data confirmed this duplication was in tandem, and predict to be out of frame. Therefore, so although this specific duplication of axon two hasn't been reported to be disease causative, however, the loss of a normal protein function are expected either through a protein truncation or nonsense mediated mRNA decay. Therefore, we are able to 
classify this tandem duplication as likely pathogenic. So case one, the missed diagnosis due to the low resolution of a CNV detection demonstrated a uniform coverage from genome sequencing actually provides the best resolution of a CNV detection and the most precise break point detection. Case two, we are going to demonstrate a case, a missed diagnosis due to repeat expansion not included. As I mentioned, um, uh, several laboratory, including us, already being able to provide a repeat expansion disorder screening using the WGS data due to the uniform unbiased sequencing data of genome sequencing. So our case two is a five months old female and the patient presents with neonatal res respiratory failure, a hypoventilation, hypoxemia, and mixed sleep apnea. So rectal biopsy showed the presence of a ganglion cell, and the patient have normal EEG and normal MRI. And then the family history and the pregnant, uh, the pregnant history are pretty normal. So previously, they already performed a panel and also a axon sequencing trail test. Only a root finding was identified in SCN1A, which is, is still inconclusive for this patient. So the patient come in for a genome sequencing trail study. As I mentioned, so we can utilize a genome sequencing data to screening for around 31 repeat expansion disorder. And for this case, genome sequencing data actually identified a GCA, GCN repeat expansion in the FOX2B gene. So this is the image actually generated by graph alignment viewer to display the alignment of STR rays to a modified reference genome. So the modified reference genome shows here actually have a 33 GCN repeat. So the top panel indicates one of the allele from this proband actually have a 33 GCN repeat because we see that the clearly alignment of the data. And the bottom allele, it shows the other allele in this proband. Instead of a 33 GCN, in the middle of here, we see a lot of a dash region, which means there's a no alignment. So this is only the aligned rate only indicate we have a 20 GCA repeat. So basically, the proband have two alleles. One is expanded allele, one is the normal allele. And in the parental sample, both mother and father carry a homozygous 20 GCA repeat, which are in the normal range. So expansion of a GCN trinucleotide repeat in axon three of a FOX2B is actually associated with autosomal dominant congenital central hypoventilation syndrome CCHS, with or without Hirschsprung disease. A normal allele have 20 GCN repeats, including a 20 alanine, which will be our patient mother and father. And a heterozygous GCN repeat expansion of a 24 or 25 repeats is associated with late onset CCHS. And the expansion of GCN repeats more than 26 is actually associated with new natal onset CCHS. The identification of a GCA repeat expansion in the focus to be gene actually fit our patient phenotype perfectly. So this case is actually demonstrate the uniform and unbiased sequencing facilitate a repeat expansion disorder screening. And previously, 
we do talk about the workflow difference between exome sequencing versus genome sequencing. We highlighted the library prep for genome sequencing is very simple and takes less time comparing to exome sequencing. Why the time really matters? So our case three is a three days old baby boy in NICU. And from the phenotype I list here, we can see congenital hypo hypotonia, neonatal in in encephalopathy, stroke, tons of a phenotype, which means this is an extremely sick baby. And the patients do not have any family history. And previously, prenatal karyotyping and microarray already done, both are negative. However, the baby is extremely sick. So the, case, the baby came to our lab for ultra-rapid genome sequencing, including the step one comprehensive biochemical profile analysis. So this step one comprehensive biochemical profile analysis, including 56 inborn error metabolism ab abnormalities. Here, I do want to highlight the, time, the timeline. So the baby was born in May 10, and the test was ordered on May 12. The DBS was collected and received in our lab on May 13. So let's go over our whole genome sequencing workflow again. So first, you will extract the gDNA. It takes around two hours. After the gDNA was extracted, the gDNA will be fragmented and repair and add adapter. So this will take around seven hours. Now the library is ready for sequencing. So the sequencing and the data uploading to the software takes around 36 hours. And then it's coming to director for review. In totally 53 hours, we are able to issue a result for this patient. What do we find? So our step one comprehensive biochemical profile analysis identify several, several analyzes a slightly increased. So slightly increased in C3 and also C3 over C2 ratio and also C3 over C16 ratio. So basically, yeah, yeah, you do have a slight increase. However, the biochemical result didn't point out a very specifically diagnosis. The genome sequencing results, I did identify two missense variants. One is a likely pathogenic variant in PDHA1, and the other one is a root variant in the SYNGAP1 gene. So here I do want to focus on the likely pathogenic variants in PDHA1. PDHA1 uh, is associated an uh, X-linked disorder by which the hydrogenous E1 are for deficiency. So PDHAD. PDHAD is the most frequent form of PDHD, um, which are characterized by a variable lactic acidosis, impaired psychomotor development, hypotonia, and neurological dysfunction, which fit our patient phenotype very well. And luckily, we know that patients with PDHAD can be managed by a ketogenic diet and thymine to result in a very positive prognosis for epilepsy, ataxia, sleep disturbance, speech development, social function, and significantly reduce a hospitalization. So in this case, in 53 hours, genome sequencing actually empowers the diagnosis and further enabling a targeted medical management and, dec and decreasing the risk of medical complica complications. Hopefully right now you are agree with me that genome sequencing is one of the most comprehensive assay that integrated a single nucleotide variant, SNV, copy number variant, CNV, mitochondrial variant, repeat expansion, and 
structural variants in one assay. So genome sequencing provides a uniform coverage across the nuclear genome and mitochondrial genome for both coding region and non-coding region. Because of this uniform coverage, it actually provides the best resolution for CNV detection and also allows the most precise breakpoint detection. And also because of this uniform unbiased coverage, it results in an improved variance calling in the technically challenging region, especially the high GC region. And it also facilitates screening for the repeat expansion disorder. Hopefully you all agree with me that right now, and genome sequencing definitely has the potential to serve as a comprehensive one-stop genetic testing to shorten the diagnostic odyssey because of all of the above technical superiority. This is everything we have today. Thank you, everyone. I'm open for uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Gua. Uh, at this time, we will begin the Q&A. Just as a reminder, please submit your questions you have through the Q&A text box. And we've already gotten several um, really great questions for you, Dr. Gua, to start with. Um, to just kick us off some initial um, questions around um, the PCR approach with exome versus genome. Um, can you touch on what, just again, what PCR-free means for genome? And then historically, why, did, why was that the approach that was initially taken um, with studying an exome? There's some questions regarding um, uh, why we started off with doing an exome and started off with this PCR enrichment versus just going straight to genome historically. Yeah. And this is actually a great question. And then uh, remember that when we go through the uh, workflow difference of uh, exome and genome sequencing, and we know that for a genome sequencing, we are trying to sequence everything, the whole genome. There's no selection needed. We want to sequence in both coding region and non-coding region. So basically the library prep is very simple. After you fragmented, the, uh, the gDNA, you add the adapter and for sequencing purpose, and the library is ready, go to sequencing. And then for most of the genome sequencing, you do want to PCR free to avoid the bias introduced by PCR amplification. And then for exome sequencing, because of we, so we know that the exome is only takes uh, contains around one to two percent of a genome region. And then for our exome sequencing, we only want to enrich this coding region because we only want to sequence a very small portion of the whole genome. So that's why they will have a target enrichment. So for the target enrichment, they generally they have a two different approach, amplification based or hybridization based. So for both approach, and after your hybridization or enrichment, and you will need to, to wash away all of the non-interested regions. So the non-coding region, you do not want to get into your library. So because of this selection, is actually introduced the bias. And we know that even in the hybridization stage and the probe hybridization will be affected by the GC content and also follow the amplification and your amplification process and also affected by the PCR, the GC content and uh, leads to the different efficiency of a PCR. So uh, in the end, even you're trying to balance during the design, you still potentially to introduce some selection bias, especially for the GC region. And I believe that in one of the slides I indicate, you know, we can see clearly when with the GC rich uh, content increase, your coverage of exome is dramatically reduced comparing to genome sequencing. And, and also because of these, and then when you're looking at the 
coverage data, you will see that a very uniform coverage for genome sequencing. However, for your exome sequencing, you see a very spiky coverage. Thank you, Fen. Uh, we have many questions regarding um, the utility of genome over exome and compared to other traditional methods. Um, one question is uh, a comment first that it's rare that we find diagnostic findings in the non-coding region. So could you speak to that statement? And then also, if that's the case, if that's, if that's the primary difference or if there's another difference with genome, how do you justify the use of genome over exome as a first line test? Yeah, so from the coverage side, it is very obvious because of your genome sequencing covers both nucleotide genome and also your uh, mitochondrial genome for coding region and non-coding region. Of course, this is, this is like a fun fundamental difference between genome and sequencing. And then we know that around 15% of the a disease causing variants is actually located in the non coding region. And it can be like a deep intronic region or the promoter region. And then exome sequencing majority, uh, so they are only enriched in the exome region. And then, uh, and also some boundary, generally plus minus 50 BP between the exome and the intron boundary. And then it will be lack of coverage in the deep intronic region or the promoter region, non-encoding region. So therefore, this portion of a non-coding region variants will obviously missed by exome sequencing. And it's not only about the direct coverage difference, it's actually because of the uniformity and also unbiased sequencing, which allows genome sequencing have each shows its performance superior over exome sequencing. Like I, I, I uh, demonstrate in, during my talk in the high GC content region, and also in the uh, short tandem repeat region, and which is actually associated, so contributed to our repeat expansion disorder, and also have trouble in some of the region of like the clinical, clinical uh, variants significant in region, you do have, sometimes you will see some drop due to the sequencing bias. And all of these are uh, contribute directly to your, di can, can reduce your diagnostic yield. So that's why like in one of my slides, you know, based on our internal data on 2100, uh, so 2100 intact clinical cases, and then we can, we can see uh, dramatically, so we can, we can see a very high diagnostic yield in both genome sequencing as first tier versus genome sequencing as a follow-up testing. And then most surprisingly will be, we see that 18% of the cases who have already have uh, exome sequencing done, but still inconclusive, and they were further identified a diagnostic finding. And all of these technical superiority of genome sequencing over exome sequencing is demonstrate genome sequencing should be recommended as the first tier assay to reduce, to increase our diagnostic yield and also reduce the diagnostic odyssey. Thank you. Can you speak to the phenotype-driven um, analysis of a genome and how that might differ from doing a targeted panel, an NGS panel paired with a, um, a, 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 a separate microarray or CNV analysis? Yes. So we know that currently uh, when, when it's coming to both exome sequencing or genome sequencing data, you are facing tons, tons, tons of the variants. And then the currently, we, it's impossible for us to looking at each individual variant. And also remember, and we are trying to fishing out the diagnostic findings. So that's why uh, phenotype driven analysis is currently approach we use for the, uh, for the genome sequencing analysis. And this will be allows us to limit our analysis on the variants which are truly may potentially 
associate or contribute to the patient's phenotype. And then, so when you're looking at the, so even this is a pheno, this even this is a phenotype driven analysis, and we are looking at all over the variants, and then we prioritize this variant according to the pheno, the gene disease association, whether that will fit the patient's uh, phenotype. However, for your panel sequencing, you are only sequence, so your data only have this certain variant, a certain gene and which will be put a lot of a pressure for the, for, for the gene selection. And then you don't know, especially the uh, phenotype heterogeneity, and we don't know that actually whether your gene is, is, whether the gene panel, including all of the potential genes associated with your phenotype. In your slides, um, and we, we got a lot of questions about the different type of analyses that we can do with a genome versus an exome or um, a standalone. But one, uh, a number of the questions was about mitochondrial DNA analysis. Um, so in your slides, you mentioned that exome does not cover mitochondrial DNA analysis, but a lot of labs are claiming to include this analysis with their exome. How are they achieving that? Um, and and, and, what, and what is better, mitochondrial with as a standalone test or integrated with exome or genome? Yeah, I do want to highlight generally exome sequencing doesn't include mitochondrial coverage, but it truly depending on the de uh, design. And then in the slides for the mitochondrial genome coverage, I did, did compare uh, three different exome base we used in our laboratory. And we can see that depending on the design and then your mitochondrial genome coverage can be very different. And why, why more and more labs and also the exome design want to have the coverage in the mitochondrial genome. And we know that uh, you know, when we're talking about uh, the uh, mitochondrial disease, it, it can be, it's very difficult, sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate is this, is this a mitochondrial disease or it's a neuromuscular disorder or any other disorder. So therefore, in order trying to provide the best coverage, and then uh, we do want to, the other side will be, when we're talking about mitochondrial disease, it's not only mitochondrial DNA, and also our nuclear genome, and also contribute to mitochondrial disease. So therefore, you do want to have a uh, one inconclusive data to cover both nuclear genome and mitochondrial genome in one single assay, and then so that can help you to maximum differentiate to find the diagnosis. But of course, it depends on your design. And then we know that for mitochondrial disease, heteroplasmy is one of the issues we need to solve. So that's why when you're looking at uh, mitochondrial genome sequencing, no matter this is a standalone assay versus embedded to exome sequencing or genome sequencing, you really need to looking at the LOD. So the limit of a detection of a heteroplasmy, and you want to know that whether it fits your expectations. And like you said, that's just one of the questions we have about all the supplemental analysis that can be done with genome. There's a series of questions around the confirmations that may be needed after a genome. So do we need to do confirmatory studies um, on, uh, first of all, uh, trinucleotide repeat disorders? Yes. And then I do want to, you know, I thinking that I didn't mention, but I do want to highlight here. So as far as I know, currently, because of all of our genome sequencing, and it's still short read. The limitation of a short read sequencing um, is de decided that we might be able, we might not be accurate to call out the long stretch of a repeat expansion. So therefore, the currently repeat expansion disorder uh, by WGS is a screening base. So we are confident to all the region for zoo out purpose. So whenever a, that uh, repeat expansion disorder was identified, definitely a confirmatory assay will be needed to confirm this diagnosis. 
keeping in mind and the repeat extension by WGS is still a screening assay. Yes, you do need a confirmatory assay to confirm. How about for CNVs detected by XM or genome? So um, CNVs by WGS is actually really high resolution and also based on the reads, uh, like the split reads, and then you can see clearly in the breakpoint. And then currently in our laboratory, we do not performing any confirmatory assay for the CNV because of the resolution and the sensitivity specificity for genome sequencing is the best. Thank you so much. There were a lot of great questions today. I'm sure we could go on and on, um, but I want to be respectful to everyone's time. So this concludes today's member webinar. Um, Dr. Go, do you um, do you want questions if there still are some to be emailed to you? Uh, yes, and if you have further questions, feel free to email to me and I share my email at the end of the slide. And then I will try my best to answer you back. Thank you. Perfect. On behalf of the NSGC webinar subcommittee, I wanted to thank you all for attending this webinar and offer a huge thank you to our speaker for sharing her information and experience. This webinar recording will be posted to the webinar page of the NSGC website within 48 hours. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.